I'm very excited to introduce uh, this lunch talk and our uh, terrific speakers today. Uh, but before I do that, first of all, I just wanted to encourage people uh, to feel free to uh, tweet uh, about this event uh, on the hashtag uh, BKCHarvard. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, opportunity for questions when our two presenters uh, finish up. So I would ask that you uh, uh, think about your questions and hold them until uh, they, they, they complete their presentation. Um, and uh, and uh, we certainly encourage and welcome those of you who are new to the Berkman Lunch Talk series to uh, feel encouraged and empowered to, uh, to, to ask questions. Uh, we, we love when new people uh, come, and you're very welcome. And so uh, please uh, ask questions when the time comes. Now, algorithmic accountability and governance are things that are uh, really important to the uh, work that Berkman Klein uh, has focused on for, for quite some time. So, uh, so I'm, I'm quite excited about our presentation today on algorithmic consumers. Uh, our two speakers are Michal Gal, uh, who's a professor and director of the Forum on Law and Markets at the Faculty of Law at University of Haifa in Israel. Uh, she's the author of several books, including Competition Policy for Small Market Economies, and she's been chosen as one of the 10 most promising young legal scholars in Israel and is one of the leading women in competition law around the world. Neva Elkin Koren is a visiting professor this semester here at HLS, uh, where she's been teaching digital copyright, and uh, we're very pleased that she's been a faculty associate uh, at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, she's the founding director of the Haifa Center for Law and Technology and the former dean uh, at the University of Haifa Faculty of Law. Her research has focused on legal institutions that facilitate private and public control over the production and dissemination of knowledge and she's an expert on digital governance and, uh, as you'll see in the next few mi moments, legal oversight of algorithmic decision making. So uh, with that, thank you, uh, and I'll turn it over to you. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share this uh, paper with you today. Uh, it's actually a paper. We forgot to upload the, uh, this version uh, to the website, but we'll do it uh, right after this presentation. But it's also a part of a project and uh, a few projects that uh, we have been collaborating on, and therefore we uh, are very much looking forward to your uh, input and reaction to some of the ideas that we want to um, uh, present. We have actually presented this uh, in various formats in the different worlds in which we uh, reside. Uh, and, and we should probably thank you for just bringing us together. This is, would be the first time we presented together. And uh, so let me say a few words on the challenge that brought us together. Michal is a world expert in, in competition law, uh, working on digital markets and two-sided markets and, and, and uh, markets of free goods. And I've been working on um, uh, algorithmic uh, decision-making and especially on developing the legal institution that could help us oversight. Uh, uh, this type of decision making, and um, in in the course of uh, co uh, supervising a PhD st a student uh, of us um, that is working on the future of uh, um, data markets um, and uh, behavioral advertising, it actually occurred to us that maybe we have been focusing on the wrong issues. That is, um, a lot of the discussion that relates to behavioral advertising look at behavioral advertising as the problem. And in behavioral advertising, we're looking at practices where uh, you know some services are provided for free in order to attract consumers. Consumers are then provided as a resource where the activities are being uh, monitored and documented, and then the data collected on consumers is being used in order to sell 
uh, services that are more tailored to cater what is assumed to be their needs. And the question is uh, whether uh, this model is already um, outdated, whether it's at all efficient to use this uh, system and the tool that we are uh, looking at um, in order to uh, convince consumers to buy where we can actually use data and uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to put together directly suppliers and consumers. So when uh, we look at the literature looking at algorithmic consumers, we often see the dark sides and uh, we, we get some uh, serious challenges and uh, concerns regarding consumers' autonomy and privacy and uh, hidden discrimination and some of the risks to, for a collision and power in the market. But in fact, a lot of this literature and, and some of it we've heard uh, in this Berkman talk that we heard last week, a lot of the literature uh, focus on suppliers. And the question is whether we can actually focus on consumers, whether we can imagine a technology uh, that would actually work for consumers. And more importantly, whether we can imagine a market, whether we can envision a market that would actually produce these type of con algorithmic uh, consumers that would actually uh, work for uh, promoting the values that we care about. So uh, that is uh, basically our project, looking at the affordances that are provided by some of the tools that we're all using and that we see are coming, and uh, better understand how they work, what type of affordances that they offer, and especially look at the market dynamics that they create. If there is one uh, insight that, uh, you know, that uh, or bottom line that we can give you from this uh, lecture, it is that the, the way uh, uh, these affordances will come about would probably depend on market dynamics and uh, to some extent on the way uh, our reg regulatory uh, intervention would shape them. So uh, if we take a closer look at some of the tools that we're using, some of the tools are actually here, you know, we, we use a lot of uh, tools that would assist us in uh, uh, consumer, uh, in, in executing uh, online uh, transactions, uh, rec ranking uh, applications, recommendation applications, they always own devices, some um, apps that help predict the price. But uh, when we talk about uh, algorithmic consumers, we talk about uh, a new generation of uh, systems that actually go beyond uh, this offering of more information of, or using information more efficiently and we look at systems that would actually help us identify our needs and help us select the optimal transactions and uh, in many cases would also help us to execute uh, these transactions. And, and our argument in the paper is that actually even though these technologies do not reflect any major technological leap, uh, they actually might be a game changer in terms of uh, the market behavior, but also in terms of the legal challenges that they are uh, posing. So if we take a closer look at uh, this transaction or the way algorithmic uh, uh, consumer systems would uh, perform, uh, we see a lot of uh, da data sources, the Internet of Things, a lot of sensors, uh, wearables, uh, detecting uh, some of our behavior signaling uh, a refrigerator that give a signal of that uh, we are out of milk. Um, uh, the use of data analytics in order to uh, provide some meaning for this type of data that is collected by these sensors, and then the use of AI in order to make decisions regarding the best um, transaction and then the use of sh shopping bots in order to actually execute the payment, arrange the delivery uh, that goes back to the consumer. So if we think, for instance, of a sensor that is linked to uh, a pet, 
and to a food bag, and the sensor would detect some information about the health situation of our cat, um, and, and also the qu quantity of food that we have in the bag, that could be communicated and linked to a lot of other, uh, lots of other data that is collected from other cats and uh, food bags uh, around the region or the country, but also with other data sources that would uh, provide uh, some meaning to whether uh, the, you know, the temperature of the cat to signal a disease or not, whether they need more nutrition, whether, um, and, and, and what is the price situation, you know, whether we should switch from the uh, cat's food that uh, we bought in the past, you know, in the past to something uh, new. Once this information is being processed, uh, the uh, selection of the best an optimal decision could be made and uh, the transaction could be executed uh, by uh, the system. Consumers in this scenario would only have to opt in to a system of that sort and, that, and then a lot of the you know, other activities will be taken care of. So um, there are, of course, some um, obvious um, advantages of um, a system of that sort, um, they're really trivial, but you know, lowering the cost of that transaction and making it uh, more quick and speedy, enabling us to uh, address a lot more transactions that, than, uh, that we need, uh, enabling uh, consumers to um, take advantage, advantage of systems that allow a more sophisticated analysis of some of the parameters um, and to take into account a lot of uh, different parameters in the decision. Um, I think some of the advantages are less, less obvious. For instance, the way in which algorithmic consumer systems can help us Overcome some of the biases created by uh, systems that are more that are using all sorts of manipulation, helping us to be more rational in our choices, uh, buying what we need rather than what we crave for. Um, uh, in some cases, um, you know, not to uh, go after the colorful. Uh, package or the attractive commercial, but actually make a decision uh, that is true to, um, to our needs. And, and I think um, also not uh, trivial is, is the ability to defer some decisions to the system and leave a, a consumer according to their preference with uh, the decisions that really matters to them. Uh, and so when we talk about information overflow, that could be a, a really important option. Not all of us want to uh, make specific choices regarding our you know, paper towels and you know, what type of, uh, uh, you know, and, I don't know, the, 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 the brand of sugar that we want to, um, to, to order. Uh, there are, of course, some... Um, um, downsides to that. Uh, um, we, talk, we, we can see these system becoming, systems becoming more vulnerable or make a bigger chunk of our life more vulnerable to um, cyber attacks. Um, we, um, we could talk about it more in the Q&As, but the system could convey uh, our preferences, but it won't <coughs> Sorry, at what point and uh, the system will um, actually shape our preferences, taking nudging into account. How do we secure against that? There is always a fine line between the two. Um, of course, some reduction in autonomy, consumers would opt for that, but to what extent they can leave some uh, discretion, how much discretion, uh, uh, discretion uh, consumers would have in using such systems once you buy into it. Um, if we give up our uh, decision-making capabilities and the ability to choose and select for the small decisions, are we going to weaken our ability to make 
the big decisions? Is this like a muscle? That's more for the psychologist. Uh, uh, in the room, there are some cognitive effects, of course. Uh, so, you know, if using every new technology, some have been documented uh, in the literature, just, uh, right? I mean, the shift from maps to GPS and the way it affected our brain and sense of uh, location. And of course, the big elephant is privacy, right? And um, we, we don't want to live in the matrix. Um, and um, we need to be able to protect against that. But the argument of the paper is actually that a lot of these downsides are actually, actually depend on what's going to happen in the market, in, which, in what type of market these technologies uh, will evolve, and how is market dynamics is going to facilitate uh, diversity uh, and, and create some... Um, um, capabilities for overcoming some of these uh, uh, challenges uh, and others. We did not mention collusion, discrimination, and power, but for that I will turn to Michal to continue and walk us through these. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so um, what I want to talk about is to look a bit uh, on how this technology might shape market relationships. And then we start, I mean, we talked a, a bit, Neva talked a bit about how it would shape uh, uh, consumers' uh, um, uh, welfare. Um, of course, it's uh, much more in the paper, but let me talk a bit about suppliers. How would it affect suppliers? So um, one of the things that, it, um, that would change is it, in what to invest. What would suppliers invest in a world where we have algorithmic consumers making some of the cons consumption decisions for people? So um, part of it would be uh, investing less in marketing, which caters to irrational uh, biases. Some of it might be less physical stores and uh, investing more in virtual uh, ones. Uh, some of it would uh, be uh, investing less maybe in translating your websites because the algorithm doesn't really care what language uh, um, the uh, website or the offer is in. Uh, part of it would be uh, in uh, reducing the level of risk uh, or uh, that, um, that, pr that buying from you would um, create because maybe the algorithm might be able to look at that parameter as well. Another thing is that um, it might affect how much to invest because if decisions become at least a bit more rational with regard to some products, then you can make different decisions than the ones that you made before. And another thing is that it might even create fairer contract. And why is that? Even today, there are people who are working on algorithms which can actually read okay, the contracts which are offered by um, um, suppliers online and suggest how fair the contract is. And if you know that the algorithm is going to give points to how fair your contracts really are and put that in the decision algorithm, then it might lead us to maybe a bit more fairer contracts than we have today in a world in which we usually just accept the contract which is online, not really reading what we are, um, um, what we are agreeing to uh, with regard to many transactions. Now, let me uh, talk a bit uh, now about the interactions between uh, um, consumers on the one hand and suppliers on the other. Now, I, uh, um, I think that these interactions lead us to some of the most important things that come out of the paper. Because as Neva said, some of the, uh, re most of the research about algorithms in the marketplace has focused on suppliers and it has created or it has uh, uh, focused on some of the problems that algorithmic suppliers can actually create in the marketplace and uh, are actually uh, um, creating. So one of them is, for example, discrimination. Because if the supplier has an algorithm that knows what your preferences are, what your past choices were, who you are, 
if it has information about your digital shadow, that it might be that the price that different consumers are offered through this algorithmic supplier are going to be very different depending on the level of elasticity of demand of each and every consumer. And actually, this is created, uh, um, uh, this is already created in the marketplace. You saw last week, uh, it was uh, uh, about almost perfect price discrimination uh, with regard to at least some of the um, uh, algorithms that are operated by uh, suppliers. So one of the things that we suggest here is that um, uh, algorithmic consumers can actually fight part of this uh, discrimination. How can they do that? They can do that by, uh, two, uh, um, uh, in two ways. One is that now you have an intermediate which buys on your behalf. And if that intermediate, um, if, um, uh, if the supplier does not know who uh, the intermediate represents, then it would have to change its pricing decisions. Another one is the aggregation of consumers by an algorithmic consumer. Because the way we envision the market or the way these algorithms already operate is that not, uh, it, it, it's not that there's one algorithm per person, but rather there will be several algorithmic consumers which are offered in the market. They're already offered by Siri and others. Um, um, and each will have, uh, each will represent a lot of consumers. Now, if that is true, then when you uh, make a, uh, um, when you buy something through the algorithmic consumer, it can aggregate the choices of many, many buyers. So it can buy, for example, a thousand uh, a certain uh, a, a, a thousand books of a certain kind. However, the supplier would not know who these thousand people are. So it cannot really discriminate and change the price according to each and every one of these uh, consumers. Um, another thing that um, uh, many people are talking about, this is actually a very big issue for competition law people. There's going to be uh, uh, an event in the OECD about this. Many uh, um, competition authorities, including the American FTC, are looking very closely at this kind of behavior. Is that algorithmic uh, uh, suppliers, sorry, uh, um, um, have a tendency now to engage more in I wouldn't even call it collusion. I would call it in parallel, uh, uh, parallel uh, conduct or in, um, in coordination. And algorithms actually make it much easier to coordinate between suppliers. And why is that? Because um, you can do it through the algorithm. You don't actually need to meet and sit together and decide. The algorithm, once it has a model, uh, which um, um, uh, reacts to other uh, um, models in the market can create coordination, a very high level of coordination in the market. It's immediate. Somebody reduces the price, there's a millisecond and the other algorithms also of suppliers reduce the price. So why would the first supplier reduce the price in the first place if everybody else is going to react? Okay, so things that for many years we assumed were, do, were done through human interactions and took time and sometimes we had, um, we could find traces and limit them today or uh, can be done through um, algorithmic suppliers. And so Algorithmic consumers can counter this at least, um, uh, at least partially. This is really a partial answer here, but part of it comes from buyer power and calculation power uh, that can counter some aspects by, for example, deciding that no matter what the price is, you are always going to uh, um, buy a certain amount from a newcomer in the market, or if the price it rises above a certain level, then you would wait and not buy beyond that level. Now, if there are several algorithmic, supply, uh, algorithmic consumers, which many consumers buy, then they can overcome some of the co collective action problems that arise in, 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 this, uh, in this world. Another thing that is um, on the agenda today, and last week there was a big conference about this in, uh, in at the University of Chicago, is concentration of many of, uh, of, of the markets. And here again, uh, we believe that um, um, algorithmic consumers can solve at least 
partially part of the problem of, uh, uh, of this uh, concentration in important markets. And I want to talk especially about certain markets because today there's a, a, um, a handful of uh, digital intermediaries in, uh, the, with mega platforms which control effective points of access um, to potential users in many markets. And if you think about it, think about smart devices. So we have the iPhone and we have the Kindle, for example. We have operating systems. We have iOS and Android application stores. We have Apple Store and Google Play. And I can give several more examples of these mega platforms which control a lot of information and create highly concentrated market. And once access to such platforms is essential for uh, suppliers um, and consumers, they have a lot of power uh, which can be translated into uh, harm to consumers. Um, and that is part of the work that was uh, presented here um, last week. And part of the problem is that they control big data. They control a lot of the data because we do a lot of our searches or a lot of our digital uh, um, uh, activities through these agents. Now, how? Uh, uh, now, uh, this has led some authors to decide that uh, to to have a bleak world view, in which um, these mega platforms are also going to control the digital butlers, and they are going to operate in their favor rather than for consumers. And what we're saying is that we're, we, we should not be so bleak and uh, we think that um, technology is a bit like a phoenix which reinvents itself time and again, sometimes, of course, with the assistance of correctly structured uh, regulation. And so that degrees of uh, power and methods of control might change. And let me offer you just a bit uh, of, uh, of the thinking that uh, we... Um, uh, just a bit of what we're thinking here. So part of it is, of course, the um, counter uh, um, um, power of algorithmic consumers that um, can create other sources of uh, supplying consumers with at least some of the things that they look for in search engines, for example. Part of it is the locus of data because um, once you think about search as the main gateway to consumers and to suppliers, that creates one world view. However, we're not there. We're already in a world of IoT. We're already in a world where we have sensors, billions of sensors all over our world. And it, it is um, uh, suggested that we are going to have many more. And so we're going to have many more sources of data. And, and some of them are going to be to provide even better data than we have today. And if that is true, then it might be that uh, um, uh, the control over data and over our digital shadow and, um, about, uh, and uh, information about our preferences is going to be much more dispersed. And so algorithmic consumers can use that information and, uh, and uh, operate in a world which is much less uh, concentrated than uh, we see today. Some regulatory implications, I'm going to go very fast through this because I've already taken a lot of time and we want to hear your questions. Um, because there's so many things, interesting things, that this um, um, new technology creates. Uh, questions, uh, many intriguing questions. For example, in contract law, issues like um, can a, an algorithm uh, operate in bad faith? Like in tort law, who is responsible for an harm which is created by an algorithm? For example, uh, in uh, consumer law, uh, what should be considered manipulation in such a world where algorithms talk with each other? Corporate law, uh, uh, for example, when is an agent uh, um, within his duties when he's not following an algorithm's uh, advice? And of course, one of the most important things here is competition law. So let me talk a bit about some of the challenges that arise in competition law, which is my area uh, of research. So one of them is access to users. Because if the way to access users is through these intermediaries and they are concentrated, 
then algorithmic consumers might be good technologies, but they might not be able to access users. So that might be one thing that we would need to think about. I think more important is access to data. Where is the data located? Who has control over the data? Will the IoT create more data which is more dispersed? And so the data uh, which is created by searches would be of less importance in this, uh, uh, in this world. Just envision a world in which we have a sensor on our glasses, which allows the algorithm to know what exactly we're doing at every minute, and then a sensor on our body, which uh, uh, um, allows the algorithm to know some of the reactions that we have to the real world. Okay, we're already, you know, uh, the technology is already there. Um, um, exclusionary conduct, I think, is a very big challenge, and, and this is something that we would need uh, uh, to think about. Um, and a part of it, um, I can talk about it more, and we can talk about it more in the Q and A. But part of it is what happens if an algorithmic consumers decide not to buy from a certain seller, or, for example, exclusionary conduct by intermediaries because they would like to control the algorithmic consumers. If you think about it, um, and if you look at their, um, um, at, at their uh, um, investments, uh, these large firms, um, yeah, eBay and uh, um, Apple and Google, have invested a lot of money in the past uh, two years or so in creating these digital butlers so that we should use their digital butlers rather than other firms' digital butlers because they do not want to lose the gateway to consumers. And finally, buyer power. Um, what happens in a world where these algorithmic consumers might be very big and strong? Should we rethink some of our policies? I would say yes. If you want the answer, let's wait for the Q&A. Why? <laughs> so thank you so much. And actually, the paper is going to be published. We are. We made a mistake not putting it online, but you can definitely find it on SSRN, and it's going to be published in the last stages of being uh, um, edited for the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you first. Uh, this was really interesting. Um, and uh, one question that I was thinking about is that it sounded like uh, a lot of the benefits that you were talking about rely on having a robust and independent uh, market of algorithmic consumers. And it seems like in some cases uh, uh, the, uh, the algorithmic uh, suppliers uh, have uh, recognized that possibility and have tried to sort of also create the algorithmic consumers. Like if you ask Siri for a ride, it will only give you the options that they have allowed people to plug in. If you ask Alexa to buy you cat food, it will only search on Amazon for the preferred cat food supplier. And so my question is, you know, what are sort of the necessary ingredients or the, or the next steps to try to create this more robust uh, uh, market of algorithmic consumers so that people aren't necessarily locked in to, into Alexa, which is then tied into the Amazon ecosystem or like, you know, examples like that. I will start with your concern. Do you like it that you can only buy through Alexa the things that are available in, on Amazon? Probably most of us don't, right? And so I think that in a lot of the discussions, we uh, underestimate consumers' demand, right? And so that we look at, for instance, some of the privacy issues, and we think about the situation where a lot of data is collected and there is no, no one is catering for privacy. But some companies do cater for privacy. Maybe we don't like the idea that privacy is for sale. Maybe we want privacy to become a public good that everyone would have it. But there is a market for that. So once you create some demand for appliances that could talk to different consumers, and that would be, be very beneficial. And I think our prediction is that as we move to the Internet of Things, uh, there'll be more pressure. I mean, right now, the choices are, you know, are very, you know, like limited that you can make, right? So when Kindle 
for Amazon is only governing your books, and then Alexa would also govern your music selection. But once it will become a market of commodities, and as Michal uh, mentioned, a lot of the information, the data, the collection of data would be more dispersed and would be owned by more of the locations on the ground. It would actually matter not only whether you hold a lot of data, but also whether you own the infrastructure. <laughs> and we, we assume that that would encourage more competition. So one is from the demand and one is from the sources of the data. Right. Let me just add to it from a, a point of view um, of competition. Um, because um, I think that um, the question you raise is an important one. And I think that's where regulation comes in. Because we think about, we should know what technologies are out there and ask ourselves, um, what are the kinds of barriers that um, firms are likely to put up so that we would not get to where we want to be? So one of the, uh, of the methods, of course, is for firms who are currently um, controlling the data and have a lot of power, like Google, to try and stay in the market game and not lose a lot of the power because of the IoT, just like uh, 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 Neva said. So one of the things that they're doing is tying. It's like Siri, what it does, it, it, it ties a lot of free services which you are already uh, using and um, a system which you're already aware of and a lot of uh, uh, free suggestions uh, and services together with this algorithmic consumer. And the question becomes of, uh, I think that we should look again about um, whether this kind of tying should be allowed uh, under what circumstances it should not be allowed. What are the pros and cons? Should we um, ensure that there's more information? Would information solve the problems? Consumers knowing that the algorithm does not uh, um, 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 work in their favor. Uh, and, and so all these questions are, are questions that I think are important to put on the table. Adrian Gropper, I work uh, for an advocacy group, uh, Patient Privacy Rights, uh, directly in the space. And um, I'd like to hear how we, you think we might solve the regulatory capture issues that I face uh, all the time uh, to sort of oversimplify it, the consumer side is not organized. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what happens with respect to the regulations you're alluding to is effectively unable for either the patients or the physicians, in my case, to participate in. So uh, I don't think that there is a, a ready-made solution for, for capture. But I think that uh, you know, the, the argument that we are trying to make is that consumers can also use the technology on their favor. And here, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, market players. That could also be like NGOs, right? And so some of the information that Michal has mentioned could actually come from NGOs. And, and you're right. They're always underfunded. They're not well represented. In, uh, they're sometimes not even invited to the table of the regulatory decision making. Um, but um, using this technology would not make them weaker. That could make them stronger. So use it in collective action. That would be one option. It's not going to solve the problem of capture. It's, there is no. Unfortunately, uh, at, least, at least not in this particular you know, technology, we can see a future with no uh, political capture. But uh, I think uh, I'm not, but not necessarily make things worse, maybe a little bit better. So uh, Urs, I'm the executive director of the Berkman Center. So thank you so much for, for the talk. My question is uh, also linked to last week's um, presentation in one way or another, and that is uh, the takeaway last week was, well, competition law only goes that far. Look uh, at privacy, and now I hear a little bit, well, but you know, despite all these privacy issues, look at competition law, and we can help on that side. So, um, so I'm 
puzzled in a way. And uh, my question is, as you were addressing Ryan's um, question about the market conditions on the one hand side, then looking at uh, the regulatory responses that can be helpful to create the market conditions, where do we stand uh, with our some sort of, of repertoire of, of frameworks and theories uh, either understanding markets or regulation and how f up to date are these frameworks and theories mm -hmm. as we deal with some of these opportunities and challenges that you mapped out. Are we well equipped um, to make these determinations where the markets work and where, where not and what types of regulatory tools we can use and what not intervening in these very new uh, types of ecosystems you described. It's a bit of a meta question, but I think an important one. Very good question. Do you want to start with the competition, Amy? Sure. Um, um, one of the exciting things from an academic perspective of this world is that many, um, um, many worlds come together. You can actually not speak about competition law and disregard privacy or consumer protection or other things. It all has to be combined. And this is one of the challenges that we're facing, that how do you combine all these different issues? And, um, and one of the problems with competition law, especially in the US, but less now in Europe, and actually I think that Europe in a way is leading here um, uh, uh, over the, um, the approach taken in the US is that Europe is starting to think about non-price um, factors which come into a competitive decision because we all talk about a comparative advantage in the market. A comparative advantage doesn't necessarily come from price. Price is only one of the parameters that we take into account as consumers when we make our decision. Another one, for example, might be the level of privacy which is uh, offered by a certain firm. And so one of the things that um, the Germans and the um, French, uh, 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 the German and the French authorities have started to do is to look at uh, privacy as a quality issue and then take that into account with regard to competition law decisions. And another example is, for example, with regard to free goods. This is an area which I've uh, written on with uh, Dan Rubenfeld. And, um, and, and there, one of the issues is, if it's free, then it doesn't affect the market price. However, it might affect the quality of the good. Okay, so we need to change our um, tweak, in a way, what we already have, and start thinking about new tools. Sometimes all we need is to change a bit. For example, for anybody who knows competition law, there's uh, the um, uh, a small, uh, there's the SNP test, uh, which focuses on price. And one of the things that, that we can do is change the focus, not only on price, put quality parameters there as well. However, some of the challenges will have to completely be rethought and you can't work within the, the, the framework. And one of them is what I alluded to before is oligopolistic coordination or oligopolistic uh, um, parallel uh, pricing uh, through uh, algorithmic suppliers. Here I think that we would need to really rethink um, uh, our tools because the ones that we have, the assumptions they're based on do not work anymore. Um, so we assume that uh, most markets are not concentrated. Uh, but we don't need concentration anymore for coordination in an olig oligopolistic world. We assumed that reaction would be slow so that if somebody changes the price, it would take time for others to change the price. That's not true anymore. Okay? So some of the assumptions that our, uh, that our regulation is based upon would need to be changed. So this is, this is a bad practice that both of us are answering each question because we're not going to hear <laughs> a lot more questions. So I'll just be quick. Um, I absolutely agree with you. This is a, an excellent uh, meta question. And I think it's true for all uh, the shift to algorithmic decision making. And I think it's just to the way you link privacy and competition is also important. And I think that here again, Europe, you know, was leading in its thinking. So, for instance, the idea that you bring back the power to the people. The privacy probably in Europe would have to be reconsidered, just the idea of, you know, having an autonomous choice. I mean, in the system that we are describing, 
it would be meaningless to talk about an autonomous choice to decide what to do with your information because once you sign up to Alexa or to the algorithmic consumer that would work in your favor, you have given up, right? Uh, the use of data, at least by the provider that is collecting it in order to refine your preferences and make sure, you know, that this shadow of your, the algorithmic shadow of ours is actually making precise prediction of what it is that we need and we want. But I think in Europe there are some thinking, there is some thinking about, for instance, data portability that is built into the new privacy reform, data protection reform. That is really important. That could actually create competition. That is what we want, right? That people could, when they are fed up with Amazon and want to switch to the company that we, don't, we cannot even name because competition will emerge, uh, then they can go with their data and that actually that data would be compatible to any of the standards that would be available. This is something that, regu this is how a regulation can actually take care of competition where the data is the engine and, and, and the asset that is actually working this economy. Um, so my question is to what extent should suppliers be able to discriminate between algorithmic consumers and human consumers. And as I ask that, I think about, for example, ad blockers where developers of ad blockers try to seize consumer surplus against what publishers wish. So I could imagine the same way a large supplier like Amazon may say, we're not going to allow algorithmic consumers on our site, only humans, as a way to protect their own profit margin. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, you know, for regulatory authorities, right? This is like... Uh probably something that you don't want to allow, right? If, you're, if your assumption is that, uh, that this is good for competition and for consumer welfare, you don't, you know, you, you would probably um, hold this type of practice illegal, this type of exclusion. Owen? So thank you, this is fascinating. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, going back to Ryan's question, there is kind of a lot of optimism in the way you describe this brave mm -hmm. new world. And I'm, um, and I'm just kind of wondering, so you present these algorithmic consumers as a counterweight to the algorithm suppliers and kind of balancing the playing field. And I'm, you know, I can't, you know, I can't stop looking at the examples that you put up uh, on there. And this is, you know, Alexa and Siri, and these are all these kind of super powerful butlers as you call them, and you know, and I, and maybe I'm just more pessimistic in nature, but I see them controlling uh, the market, and and so, so I'm wondering where this optimism comes from. On the one hand, uh, <laughs> the, you know, on the other hand, there are some kind of regulatory responses to this. So we know when we're talking about intermediaries in other contexts. So, for example, there are intermediaries in other countries that are supposed to say, help us consumers choose between cell phone plans, which is a very complicated choice. And in some countries, these intermediaries have to be certified by the government, and the certification is based on the fact that they are not beholden to the suppliers, to the cell phone companies. Mm -hmm. They have to be independent in their business model. So maybe there are other regulatory ways to separate the uh, algorithmic consumers from the algorithmic suppliers. But I, I think if we don't do that by regulation, then it's going to be very difficult. Just the other kind of final point, you know, going back to these cell phone uh, decisions, it's really difficult for consumers to choose the right plan. And now I imagine that this market for algorithmic consumers will work well as you imagine it if consumers will be able to choose between different algorithmic consumers, between different algorithms. And I'm wondering, do you think consumers have the ability, the sophistication, to distinguish between the different algorithms to choose the one that is better for them? The choice of algorithm seems to be several orders of magnitude in terms of dimension more difficult for consumers to figure out. So, you know, how they deal with my preferences, what information they have, who are they beholden to, what is their business model? You know, I can think of like at least, you know, 20 different dimensions, and I can't imagine how a consumer would be able to choose effectively between these different algorithms. So, so fascinating, but I'm still pessimistic. I mean, I don't think that, I think it's, it's uh, well, first of all, I think it's always better to be more optimistic, especially nowadays. <laughs> and so I think, and also just in terms of strategy, right, to be, uh, this is a technology, it's out there, 
the genie is not going back to the bottle. The question is whether we can use it for consumer benefits or whether we give up on that. And in some, you know, you'll see that in the paper itself, sometimes we call it algorithmic wars. And we, you, we, we think about this as a competition between algorithmic, al algorithms, you know, pulling into different directions. And I think that, um, you know, some of the problems that you mentioned are valid. And I think that it's when you think about consumers making a choice ex ante, thinking what would be the best way, you know, which would be the best algorithmic butler that could serve me, I think that could be very complicated and sophisticated. But then if you think about the experience and the ability to check out and in, you know, to this system, then you think about a, a competition that is more um, uh, vibrant and actually could be more effective. And actually, that's what we have seen in cell phone, com you know, between mobile companies, right? Once there is competition of that sort, and people can just go in and out, you know, with a certain provider, then, com you know, that created some pressure, uh, competitive pressure. Let me, uh, I'll just um, be very quick and pointing a few things. Uh, I envision a world in which algorithms um, um, help us choose the algorithmic consumers. So you will actually have an algorithm making all the comparisons and telling you, Oren, you know, for this, this is best. Sorry? Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. So this is one of the things that might be in this world. And another one uh, is, of course, information. There, as long as you have enough information about different, uh, and you have di different examples of what is the best choice for you that in that world and what the algorithm chose for you. If there might be some method of doing it, maybe through algorithms as well, of providing you with this information, then you'll know Siri is not really good for me. Or it's not good for me with regard to these decisions, but it's good for that. And you're completely right that right now, the firms that are investing in these algorithm and consumers are not necessarily maybe the ones that we would have wanted to invest in that. But does that mean that others will not invest? I don't think so. Hi, uh, Vivek Krishnamurthy with the Cyber Law Clinic. So um, a question and a comment. So the question is this. Um, do you envision this working across all markets for all products, or are there certain kinds of markets that are particularly well suited? So I think about the market for toothpaste versus air travel, right? There are 36 varieties of toothpaste at Target, right? And how do I choose between them? It's bewildering. But it's also hard to get to reveal my preferences, right? Whereas airfares. Um, it's a market where information is a lot freer, where the goods are more comparable and that the distinctions between the goods can be more readily drawn. So I can more easily see an algorithmic consumer acting as my fiduciary, that's the comment, uh, on, on uh, airlines than on toothpaste, right? So the second is, if you're going to interpose uh, a new kind of intermediary that's going to make these choices and collect a lot of information, from a regulatory perspective, I would think that it would have to be a fiduciary. It would have to have a legal responsibility to optimize my welfare mm -hmm. and not someone else's to prevent capture and to also have the benefits to consumer welfare that you're proposing. But then the question is of cost. How, do I, how does a, this fiduciary uh, recoup the cost of the service that it provides. Is it going to be skimming a percentage as a fixed fee? I mean, there's, so, there's some interesting economics behind how one pays to get to this utopia, which I agree is a better place than we are now. But there's a, there, there's a bootstrapping problem, it seems to me, there. And just to um, piggyback off that, there was a question online on Twitter. Um, do we need a fiduciary duty for algorithmic consumers? Otherwise, they will make profit-maximizing decisions. For example, Alexa would focus on Amazon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. Um, let me um, pick up on your first question first. And uh, um, uh, do we envision this operating for all markets? Um, I think you can take it to even, uh, you know, you, you talked about toothpaste versus airfares. These are easy examples. Let me give you, uh, uh, I think, uh, ones that I think are more uh, uh, problematic. Um, would we allow the algorithm to choose, for example, um, our president? 
or our representative. Maybe it can make a better choice. I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyway, or our business partner. <laughs> or our business partner. I, I, would, I would think that in some spheres, uh, that would be problematic. And I would even say that in some spheres, uh, um, uh, we ourselves are not going to uh, exercise that. And let me give you another uh, uh, challenge here. Would we allow children, very young children, to make their decisions through algorithms, algorithmic consumers? Or is it a skill, making a choice? Is it really something that we want the children to learn? And so that we would prevent the use of these algorithmic consumers from a certain age with regard to at least certain products. So this, uh, this um, uh, choice uh, of where exactly we apply these algorithms that make choices, at autonomous choices for us, is, I think, an important one. And uh, there's uh, uh, the next paper, which is already written, but not online, which deals with these issues. So if you want, you can send us an email, and uh, we will uh, send it to you. Now, with regard to fiduciary duty of the algorithm, some people have even taken it one step further and said that the algorithm itself should be um, uh, given um, identity, given a, a legal identity. Um, I think that's taking, I, I would not go there. I mean, I would say, I mean, I, I think about um, who um, created the algorithm, who operates it, who uses it. Uh, who controls it, but not necessarily the algorithm itself, because I think then it completely blurs our roles as humans in using it and creating it. However, I think that we can think about systems where uh, the ones who operate at least algorithms in certain risk, uh, high risk uh, um, uh, markets, would have to have a, a certain kind of insurance. So I, I would go with the insurance rather than the fiduciary duty of the algorithm. Can I just uh, say just quickly that fiduciary, yes. You know, I think that that's a very good framework legally, and but that goes uh, to a lot of uh, our, you know, my own thinking about data and the way it has to be handled. And I think um, that uh, with respect to the cost, just very quickly, we're talking about algorithms. We sort of so uh, we became so cynical that we forgot about open source, and that this is something that can actually be developed um, bottom up. And so we look for the Amazons of the world to create these things for us. But this is something that actually has some advantage to the crowd uh, in combining data and and creating the code. So I I would also think about you know, the role of civil society in here. Hi. Um, I'm Actually, Christoph. if we could um, interrupt you just for a second, Christoph. We're going to stack three questions. We're going to throw three questions, the last three questions. They're going to come from you, Ron, and you, and, um, and then answer them. Can you do that? Do you mind? OK. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Christoph Graber, faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center and visiting from the University of Zurich. So first, thanks very much for um, studying what happens when the genie is out of the bottle. Um, so you are very optimistic, as uh, it has been uh, said already. And uh, it appears to me that your optimism relies very much on the work of um, regulatory authorities, including um, competition authorities. But um, as Urs has already mentioned, the problem, one of the problem is to make sure that we have a comprehensive view of uh, the values and interests uh, that are uh, at stake. You mentioned also an example of how privacy issues can be reformulated within a, a scheme or a logic of a competition law. But beyond um, uh, privacy issues, there are many more issues. First, I mean, within the competition law framework, in a broader perspective, you have um, you have the, the, the company, the business interests, you have the consumer interests, and then beyond that, uh, privacy interests. But that is not all, as we have seen last week. There are also freedom of speech interests and even democracy interests. So how can you make sure that uh, all these various and heterogeneous interests are, in a way, taken into account in a comprehensive uh, way uh, in your um, model? 
And to take it a slightly different direction, my name is Caroline Tro, and I'm a researcher up at the Fletcher School at Tufts. Um, the, it seems like the assumptions that we're going to be basing the algorithms on or the algorithms we're going to be working on are going to be key. And just turning it over to machine learning might seem more attractive than relying on psychology studies or current science. And I'm thinking especially because of the current replication problems in various psych studies. Um, but machine learning can sometimes just entrench current biases rather than moving things forward in a positive way. So have you seen good mechanisms or systems to interject when algorithms might be quietly, maybe not obviously veering off course? And can they even do this without divulging some of the private details of the people that they're trying to help? So the, you know, just, just, do you want to take another question? No, those are the two. Oh, okay. Um, so um, with respect to, um, uh, machine learning and the use and, and, and the use of data, the collection of data, the basic principle of these systems is that they would work as shadows, right? Of they, they have to have access. And actually, for us as users to make this more useful for us, we would want to have it. To, we, we would want to make more information available to a system of that sort. Um, and it has, uh, and, and that actually creates uh, also a market uh, uh, dynamic that would require some trust. And that is a force that I think we, again, tend to underestimate to what extent consumer trust is important for the companies that are providing some of these um, uh, devices. And I think that. Uh, you know, if your business model is based on trust, because that would make the machine better, because it has to be trained according to your preferences, um, uh, I think that uh, sort of uh, ideally would create some partnership, right, between the con you know consumer and the the companies that are serving this type of uh, need. Um, to the extent that I heard you. Uh, y your concern, and I'm not sure that I uh, understood you correctly, uh, with respect to some past dependency in machine learning. Uh, I think that's a big that's a, that, that's a big that's a big issue, uh, and uh, I think I would assume that people would have different preferences on that, and that is a type of thing that we see now with the consumption of news, right, and the extent to which our filter bubbles are actually created based on their consumption of uh, data, you know, news and, and, and blog posts uh, um, in the past. And some people have some preferences to open it up and would look for apps that would enable them to do that and to see some news that they were not aware of before. And I think that we would see the same with respect to consumer preferences regarding commodities. Um, do you want to relate to that or to the, to the yeah. first question? Um, yeah, I, um, I, I would agree with everything that Niva said. And I would think, you know, last week I, I gave this presentation or something uh, relatively similar in Rome. And uh, a computer scientist stood up and he said, we computer scientists can create an algorithm which does not rely on path dependence. Um, it might be that, at least with regard, uh, 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 that you can maybe devise some uh, um, algorithms that can do that. Uh, right now, if you're only relying on the existing data, I think that would be problematic. However, I can envision, and I, 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 you know, I'm just, you know, thinking about the technologies that we already know. I think that part of it can come from other. The solution might come partially from other sources of data, sensors that provide information about your reactions to the real world in real time. That's a different kind of data than data about what you did yesterday, and that might change at least, or, or at least limit. Okay, it's part of the path dependence. So that's my answer here. Okay, it's a big, que it's a big question of democracy. How mm. do we, how do we address the crisis of democracy? We started the semester with your presentation on this particular issue, right? 
Um, well, as I think that that was, you know, as, as I addressed the first question, algorithms are not going to solve the problem of regulatory capture, and they're not going to solve the problem of democracy. I think that there is, uh, that we need to adjust our thinking in, I think that a lot of our discussions regarding algorithmic decision making looks at the way it is being abused by the big players and is sort of in the defensive. One of the purposes in this paper was to start to look at this as an opportunity and make and get and take a more proactive uh, um, approach to the to some of the challenges and I think that always to think about how we are going to limit the way Amazon is going to use it and how are we going to limit the way in which Google is searching for our data is good is good not that I you know, object that, I think it's insufficient. I think that in order to save democracy, and if we look at the big picture, we need to really uh, think about proactive strategies. And one of them is to offer alternatives. And then let us just be reminded that 20 years ago, if we had this conversation, we would look at Microsoft as the evil. And Google was a very small startup. It was not even a startup company. And, and so I think that we need to bear in mind that a lot of uh, these market players are changing in their status and power. And there is a role for us in creating more dynamic competition in order to facilitate this type of change. And so uh, it's not a solution, but it's a direction or a strategy of how we think that we should go about this. Well, my algorithmic consumer has told me that I should download your, your article. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's been uh, really wonderful. So, uh, so thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been great. Right